Our New Testament reading and preaching text comes from Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through the first part of verse 8. So 16, 1 through 8a. And if you want to follow along in the Pew Bible, that's on New Testament page 54. Mark 16, 1 through 8a. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on in the first day of the week when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He's been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee, There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. So early on the first day of the week, a Sunday morning much like today, a group of women headed towards a grave. In some ways, this was a group of defeated women. Their hope in a potential Messiah has been dashed on the wood of a Roman cross. These women witnessed the crucifixion, and like so many of us do when we face loss or deep disappointment, they retreated back into normal tasks of the day. Very simply, the reality is their friend is dead and somebody needs to prepare the body. They're headed to the grave to prepare the primary burial. This was the task of preparing the body with strong, smelly spices so that as it decayed, it wouldn't be so bad. It was important because these burial caves weren't single occupancy. In their time, bodies were moved in and out, would share the cave. And as the body decayed, the bones would eventually be collected and brought into an ossuary, a container room or a container where the bones were collected. This was known as the second burial. It's important that we realize there is no hint in these women that they're heading towards a resurrection. Though Jesus talked about his resurrection event with some regularity, it just didn't get through to the disciples. I had a friend whose family once was in legal trouble. And as he was telling our friend group the story, it was out there. It was outlandish, preposterous. I didn't buy a bit of it. But it turns out it was the truth. Whether Jesus' story was just too much for them to believe or their insistence on knowing how it was going to play out with the Messiah prevented them from accepting the truth, we just don't know. We know Jesus kept telling them, but it never sunk in. Instead of thinking about the resurrection, the women are concerned with practical considerations. A big stone covers the entrance to that cave. How are they going to move it? You know, maybe by this point in the book of Mark, we should be used to practical considerations not getting in the way. But that's where they are as they head there. And like many times, What should have prevented this from going forward became a mere afterthought. As they arose at the grave, they realized the stone is already out of the grave. They have free access to the burial vault. And when they get inside, they encounter something that they're also not expecting. As usual, the sight of an angel startles and alarms. And his first words to them are words of peace. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. 
But then he goes on to tell them what they're doing. You are here looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And the angel makes it clear that he died, that he was crucified, but he is no longer here. Both of those things are true with the angel. That Jesus really died, that he was really crucified, but also that he's no longer here. Assuming they would have some doubts, he shows them the spot where Jesus' body was lying. Now that they've been exposed to the reality of Jesus' situation, it's time for their mission. The angel tells them to go, to tell the disciples and Peter that Jesus is going ahead of them to Galilee. He's going to appear to them there just as he said he would. Now, I cannot stress enough what an odd scene this is setting up, what's about to take place. A group of women in this day are about to run up to the other disciples and say, Jesus has been resurrected. How do you think that's going to go over? Our story begins, as all of the other Gospels do, with the account of a group of women being the first witnesses of the resurrection. These are the most incredible and credible witnesses to the reality of Jesus' resurrection. Incredible because of how their culture thought of women. This was a heavily chauvinistic society. It was not helpful to the cause to have a group of women be the first witnesses. But it's also credible because the only reason you would include that detail is because that's the way it actually happened. In fact, in their day, if you wanted people to believe it, the best thing would be is just to leave all this out. Because these were women, they created doubt. But when we think about it in our day, when we look back, this helps us. We realize if this was a fable, you wouldn't add this detail. And all four of the gospel writers did. It was a brave admission that ends up building our trust in the document. And if what, is Mark, if, and if what Mark is saying is true, how does it change us? It sets a precedent for how we get along in Jesus' kingdom. All are equal in Christ's kingdom. Men don't dominate women. One color doesn't rule another. All of God's created are welcome to a place of equality. And as we invest in building up a kingdom that is more in line with the kingdom Jesus is establishing, we have eternal significance. When we empower those around us, that have been lessened by society, we are taking part in creating Christ's kingdom the way he is creating it. Now, there's another detail in here that I think we need to spend some time with. The angel tells the women to tell the disciples and Peter. Did you catch that part, that little detail about and Peter? Remember, Peter was the disciple that boasted that he would never deny Jesus. In fact, he threw his brother and sister disciples under the bus. He said, even if all of them do, if all of them deny you, Jesus, I won't do it. Jesus demonstrates two things with how Peter is handled. First of all, arrogance is always shallow thinking in Jesus' kingdom. No, no matter how much we are told, we are right with God because of God because of the actions of God on the cross, not because of who we are or what we have accomplished, but we always try to make it something that we've attained. And then the second, the most important, even the most egregious of sins can be forgiven if God intends. Perhaps Peter is already in a bad place, lamenting his denial and abandoning someone that meant so much to him. Maybe he cons is considered a pariah by the other disciples. He's not welcome with them, or they are already talking about him as not really being one of them. When things get hard, we have a tendency to blame and accuse. This angel has been instructed to make sure that all know Peter is welcome. Now, this may be the most powerful point for us here today. We've all made mistakes, we've all dishonored God and wounded each other. 
Yet Jesus opens the door of forgiveness for even the worst of offenders. That's me. That's you. If God is willing to forgive this guy, he's willing to forgive us too. Now I think there's also two things that we need to think about this and how it relates to our modern culture. We live a lot longer than we used to. If we lived back in the day, we would have been very familiar with death. Death would have been all around us. We would have encountered death in our household, with the neighbors, with all kinds of different experiences. In our world today, we forget that death is our biggest adversary. And the second thing is, we're generally, even in our day, we're generally separated from those that die. Grandparents usually don't die in our homes, nor is it a common experience to be around death. We're generally safe at work. We don't die by going about getting what we need. But all, for all of human history, death shadowed life. But now in our day, we can kind of avoid it or ignore it. But just because we don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. The author of the book of Mark didn't have to convince his audience that death was their opponent. His argument was that Jesus overcame it. Today, most of us fear many other things besides death. But here's the question that we need to wrestle with. If death can be defeated, what else is there to worry about? Believing this story is like living a life with a safety net. Things can go wrong, terribly wrong. We've had people in this congregation that have suffered just horrible, horrible things. But there's only so far we can fall. Instead of holding on to life like we're performing without a net, life following Jesus allows us to take risks, to do amazing things. This is what God defeating death does. It allows us to follow God's instructions, to let go of the bar when God asks us to, and to trust God with what happens. There is a lot of debate about the way the book of Mark ends. If you read along in your pew Bible or maybe even in your own Bible, there might have been some note about the shorter ending of Mark, the longer ending of Mark. There are a lot of people that don't even believe those are the right endings, that they believe that there's another one that's disappeared. They think that surely there had to be more, as there was in Matthew and Luke and John. There was more after the resurrection. And we have some manuscripts that include more, but they aren't the best manuscripts. And the language they use is very different from the language in the rest of Mark. But whether there was once more or not, the book of Mark stands solid in its message just the way it is. If Mark didn't add any other thing, not another single word, it still wouldn't cloud his main message. As it stands, the book makes us wrestle with Jesus' identity, with the reality that he suffered and he really died, but also that he overcame death. So today... On Easter, no matter what else we do, we need to wrestle with that claim. Could Jesus have really overcome death? And if he could, how does it change life as we now live it? This is an invitation to follow Jesus, to experience life as part of a kingdom that is different than anything else that we've encountered. This is an invitation to tell the disciples and to tell Peter and to tell you and me that Jesus is alive, that Jesus overcame death, that he has forgiven us by his actions. That's the message of this day. Let us pray. Loving and all-powerful God, on this day we celebrate you revealing your plan to humanity. You have defeated that which was undefeated. You have demonstrated that nothing limits you. Thank you for caring so much about us that you would make a way for calling Peter and us along with him. Continue to show us the empty tomb. Continue to reveal that you are no longer there. To grow in our belief that you have defeated all true enemies, that nothing endangers us, and that you go before us into your mission. We pray for those that feel loss on this day. 
loss of family, friends, or self. Show them your presence in the midst of their trials and guide them as they confront realities that they have wished to avoid. Holy One, you come to us with power beyond all knowing. You lift all things out of the dust and you breathe love into every cell of our being. Continue to call us into communion with you and claim victory over death. Blessed be your holy name now and forever in the name of our Savior and King Jesus Amen. Become part of a community that seeks to glorify God, to make disciples of Jesus Christ, and meet human needs. Join us at First Presbyterian Sundays at 8.30 and 10.55, or watch us on My 11 every Sunday morning at 9. We welcome you.